Hello and welcome. It's so good to see all of you here today. I've been waiting for a long time for this day and I was ooh, so nervous, but I'm very glad to see that we're nearly full today. This is the very first CBS case competition event of 2014, and we have many more to come. The next two weeks, our six preferred partners will have many events with lots of freebies to share with you. I promise the events would be corporate, but hopefully without all the boring corporate talk. So we hope to see all of you there. The panel debate today will be about the future of Denmark, survival of the fittest in business. In a bit, I'll introduce the moderator and the speakers for today, but at first, we have a winner of today's competition. So, um, please come up here and help me draw the winner for today. Sure. Yes. Thank you, Sarah. Yes. I think it's all your students who I can oh, choose. I don't think it's working. I think. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you to all your students <laughs> who actually choose to take part of the competition. All right have to pick a winner. One important topic is actually that the student is in here, so we might have to call two or three times. <laughs> uh, the winner has to follow me out after this uh, to get the car, and the car is his or hers until Monday. Yes. So, and if you haven't seen the car, you must be blind. It's the one out here, the very awesome BMW. So, uh, I drove it sometimes myself. <laughs> yeah, I've tried it too. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Let's hope, we'll, let's hope we'll choose a winner the first time. All right. So maybe if the if the student I'm drawing here is here, I think it says Maddie Swartz. Is that any one of you? Maddie Swartz. That's, very sad for Betty. <laughs> we'll try again. What about Nikolai Nilsson? Is he here today? Hmm. All right. Sorry, well, please. just think about if you're noticed down here, the chance is getting better and better. Whoops. All right. So what about Sulaiman Mukbel? No? All right. Okay, we're moving on pretty fast now. Anna Philrup? Yes? Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Woohoo! So a BMW, do you have one already? No. Nope. Great. <laughs> Congratulations for the car. There's a small one to remember as well. <laughs> Follow me out and I will show you the car. Thanks. <laughs> so that was pretty fortunate. That was uh, Nikolai from our car sponsor, Alphabet. So um, I hope a lot of you participated in the competition, although we only have one winner. A last note before we begin. In front of you, you have something to drink. There's some sweets that I hope you'll enjoy. Also, on your table, you have a comment card. Today, in the end of this session, we'll have an evaluation where we'll ask you some questions about the event. But if you have any comments along the way, please write them on the comment or on the comment card and give them to the lovely helpers when you leave today. Um, yeah. During the debate, the moderator will might ask you some questions. For those questions, you'll have to use the clickers. Also, um, he mentioned just before that he might also just make a normal hand raise, so be, pre be prepared for that. And, um, yeah. On the other hand, 
If you out in the audience have a question you would like to ask for the panel or a certain speaker in the panel, there's also an opportunity for that. If you go to our Facebook page and search for CBS case competition, you can write a message. That message will go to Clemens, who's our moderator today. It will go to his computer and he can see all your questions. That way we make sure that no one's scared to talk in front of a big audience and that everyone gets to ask their question if they have one. Of course, along the way we'll also have our microphone, so if you want to raise your hand and ask a question, of course you can do that as well. So, I guess now it's time to we actually start the panel debate of 2014. Please welcome Clay McCaskill and speakers. Can you all hear me? Well, that's excellent. Welcome. Thank you, all of you, for showing up. And thanks to the panel. We have once again, and for those of us who have been here before, we know that each and every year it's a very distinguished panel. Certainly this year, 2014, is no exception. We're going to talk about the future of Denmark, which is, we believe, or at least some people would like to hope, is also the future, at least, for some of you. And before I introduce the panel, and before we do anything, I want to ask you a question. We are going to ask you a few questions. Some of them uh, are written in advance. Uh, some of them we might improvise, and then we will have to do it just by raising hands. But let's just take the first one. We'd like to know how many of you plan at some point in your career on working in a foreign country. We'll see the question there. In a second, you will get it and you will have the options of answering yes, no, maybe, and don't know. And I'm sure you have been told, briefed about the little calculators. A, B, C, or don't know. Do you plan on working in a foreign country for a period of time when you finish your studies? Let's hear your answers. All right. Who said no? <laughs> There's just, I guess, one of you, two of you maybe, something like that. Well, I, I, think, this is, I think this is true. Uh, I think this is true of you. And then just imagine what the answers will be if we ask the same question in five or ten years' time. Now, if you go back, I know that you're all so young, you can't remember a time without iPhones. Is that right? <laughs> you, you can't remember. You can't remember that there ever was any other prime minister than Henry Tony Smith. All right, this is just, the past is already a foreign country to you people. You can't remember a time before the financial crisis, right? But back then, when you were very, very young, there used to be a time where we had this notion that Denmark really was number one. We were number one in welfare. We were number one when it came to public services. We were number one when it came to mask and legal and the rest of them. Every single topic you could discuss the world would come to us, it would learn from us. Now, this is just five, seven years ago. If you ask the politicians, they would tell you this was a great society, this was a country that was set for the future, and so forth. And something has happened. We are now living in the world of Nina Setmo Kina. And for those of you who don't understand, ask your friends, this was a television show that showed at least some parts of Denmark that apparently we're not as competitive as we'd like to be. Now, I think if you look back over the last 30, 40, maybe even 50 years, that this is quite unusual. Uh, the change, the change in the political debate over the last five or seven years in Denmark from virtually everyone working on the assumption that we are number one to virtually everyone working on the assumption that we are certainly not number one, that is huge. Something has changed. You see it, you see it when you turn on your television, you see it when you open a newspaper. So something has changed. Now, what we are talking about over the next hour and a half, some of these things are old. We know we have to be good. We know we have to work hard. Um, 
But things have changed. Things have been transformed over the course of the crisis. And so we are going to ask you questions about this. We're going to ask the panel about this. And what the next hour is about, more than anything, really is your questions. You heard about the Facebook page? You can go there, message us. I'll open up my machine in a couple of seconds, and then I'll be able to read your messages. But we also would like to ask you for, uh, for you to ask questions in real life. Remember that? Real life? All right. So this is sort of you just being here and raising your hands and a microphone uh, being brought to you, and you're then actually asking the question uh, uh, from these people. It is about your question. So in a moment, we'll listen to the panel. We'll hear their thoughts. We'll ask them to introduce each of the companies that are represented here. You know them by name, of course, but we'd like to know a little bit about the companies, and we'd like to know their, in their estimate, in their evaluation, what is the biggest challenge facing Denmark? Once we've heard from the panelists, we'll open the floor for questions. Here is Jakob Schamby from Redux, from Saxo, Martin Ernst, from Deloitte, Anna Stanz, from Carlsberg, Mass, from BCG, the Boston Consulting Group, Ian, and from Arla, Torben Nielsen. Please welcome them. <laughs> All right, Anas, let's start with you. What is the biggest challenge facing Denmark? I think, you know, I spent some time ago, oops, uh, some years ago, I spent three years in Singapore, living in Singapore. Uh, I had kids in the uh, institution, in the schools in Singapore. And it teaches me a lot about education and schools and how you need to train uh, to develop your talent. And once we came back to Denmark and we went into the public school in Denmark, I was quite surprised. That was the first touch down and touch base with the Danish school system. And I think we, if we should develop uh, talents, if we should train talents, it starts at home, but it also starts in school. So when it comes to education and it comes to train the talent, we need to do a lot better and a lot more in the schooling system. So I think uh, you all... So you're saying these, you are, these students, people already lost, it's too late for them. I lost them already, I lost them already, but I think that's, that's where we need to start. All right, so why, why, why is that so important? Why? Why? Because when you, when you look at uh, what we should do with our talents, we need talents to compete. It's the same as in sport. So now it's the Olympics. We want to be number one. We want to be number one whether it's pharma, whether it's green economy, whether it's banking, whatever industry, we want to compete and we want to be number one. Not only in Denmark, because now we are talking the future of Denmark, but it's a borderless world. It's a global world. So we want to be number one in this world. And that takes talent, and that takes education. Do you see, when people come to you today applying for jobs in your recruitment process, do you see a difference in the kind of approach that new employees have? Do they think of themselves differently? Do they think of their jobs differently? Has something changed over the course of the financial crisis? Yes, I think. Um, I think before the crisis, I think a lot of uh, uh, students came, and they could choose uh, between a lot of different companies, and it was perhaps more easy. To, to get a job, and, and they were more, um, you could say, selective. Um, and we treated them in many different ways. We almost gave them whatever they wanted in, in salary, in education, in programs, in parties, in the firm. It was very different. Today... Where do you come? Yeah. <laughs> you want to apply? Um, today, it's different. We want uh, talent, we are being much more focused on exactly which kind of talent we want, uh, how we want to train them, how we want to develop them, and how we want them to fit into our culture and our values. So I think when we later talk about what uh, is the value proposition of Denmark, it's the way we are used to cooperate with other people. That's about culture values, of, I'm sure we come back to that. All right, and now, finally, in 15 words or less, what is Deloitte? What is Deloitte? In 15 words or less. That, that <laughs> Deloitte is the world's largest audit and consulting firm, 200,000 people. It's also the largest firm in Denmark. It's a world of talent. It's a playground where talent can develop, not only in Denmark, but globally. I've been working there for my whole life. I've been working in six different countries. It's never been one workplace. It's been many workplaces. 
I could never have imagined a better career. All right, that's nice. Now, same structure. Let's start out with the answer to the question. What is the biggest challenge facing Denmark, please? So, so basically, Clemens, I want to take it one step back, sorry. Sure. So, um, I want to start a little bit with the Carlsberg and where we come from, because I think it's important for us to understand that. So if we, if we go in the year 2000, Carlsberg was a very small Danish local brewer with about a few thousand employees. Now we are here, 15 years later, we're the fourth last, largest brewer in the world. We have 41, 42,000 people. And we actually operate in 150 markets with 500 brands. So, <laughs> so coming back to your question, and thank you very much. I'm sure you want to get my business cards afterwards. <laughs> it's a good story. It is. But I think the evolution of Casper, coming to, back to what you said, saying, so in the hindsight, we were very local. We looked for local talent. We had the local schools and the local talent base. Now being a global brewer, we suddenly have people from all over the world. Actually, the population in Carlsberg, which are Danish, is only about 6%. So right now, suddenly we see a market, and we see the talent that we can get from the outside world, and we can actually benchmark what we have. And, and I, I think I, I, I need to you know, agree with you that this is what is needed in Denmark. So I think one of our challenges is we need to understand what we're really good at, and we need to educate ourselves in that, and we need to find out how do we compete in the global world uh, based on that. What was the biggest, I mean, in terms of your, you're basically uh, uh, describing 15 years here. What was the most, what was the toughest decision? What is the toughest decision, what is the toughest choice that Carlsberg has made in that period in the transformation from being a small Danish company, the one you described, to where you are now? So basically, I would say it's about taking the tough decisions on which market to, uh, markets to compete in and how to compete with, of course, the competitors we are in the market. So, of course, there are... We have many regions, some are successful, some are less successful, but again, we need to look at it from a larger perspective saying, you know, we have a crisis in some countries, luckily, we are so diversified that we can go into other markets mm. in other countries. So, Russia now, yeah, some of you have perhaps seen the annual report right now coming up. We have a few challenges there, but luckily, we also uh, took the chance to invest in Asia, and that's, of course, our growth, growth engine right now. All right, and, and the final question that I mean, when we are talking about Denmark and we are talking about the country as such, can Denmark do the same that Carlsberg did? I, I'm sure. I'm sure we can. Because also looking at the talent and the talent base and how we work, I think we have some specific things we can export and we can grow. You know, I, I'm sure we'll come to it later. CSR, innovation, teamwork. Those will be some of the things we can take out. And in order to mature it right, I think we'll be able to be successful. So would it be right or wrong to say that we have strengths to, to play? Is it, is it true that we can imagine that we will do well in the globalized world, or is it just a matter of us having no choice? Some will thrive, some won't. Can we expect that Denmark will do well? Well, Denmark, is Denmark I think I, I would rather talk about the talent in Denmark. You know, it's also something about self-perception, I think. Because I think we in Denmark, historically, just uh, as you mentioned, we have, a, we have had, historically, a very high self-perception, self-esteem. I think we need to look the reality in the face and see what is the competition about and how do we tackle that. But yes, if we, if we manage to do that, we will be able to compete in the world. All right, Martin, same question. What is the biggest single challenge facing Denmark? I'll say I, I actually disagree with, a bit with your premise about um, we not being uh, successful in, in Denmark and in the Nordic Hemisphere. I think it's, it's very important for, for us uh, we have these very small home markets, so we need to develop outside the world. And uh, I think we need to keep that confidence. And I think if we look at the industry uh, companies in Sweden, we have a lot of industries where we're, we're the market leader in, in, in Denmark also. That we have the Nord uh, Norwegian oil service industry, uh, market leading companies. And I think that uh, we need to, to have an environment where it is actually possible for these companies to attract uh, people who are interested in work in these companies. And I think the culture that we have, the democ democratic culture that we have, we are in our upbringing, we, we have a democratic culture. I think we need to build on that. I don't want to 
rephrase what they, they just said. I think it's very important. When I look at students, I actually just hired three new students today. They started today. Hopefully they're in here from CBS. Um, and I think they are much more used to, to actually using their mind. They're much more creative than we see in other places. So how, how can you tell? If you meet two people, if you meet two bankers, two financiers, and you, how can you tell that one of them is a Dane? What are the telltale signs? When you say there's a democratic culture, I think culture. He's, uh, he's more rude, and it's, uh, in my way, it's very good. Uh, he's more, uh, he takes some chances, and uh, he, he doesn't say uh, take no for an answer, and, and he's really trying to, to push the career ladder uh, almost the first week he's in there. So uh, I think it's very good, and we like that in Saxo, definitely. All right, Ian, same question. What is the biggest single challenge facing them now? Good. Thank you, Th thank you, Clemens. We're, we are fortunate in BCG to actually have the luxury to devote some time to thinking about these things. Yeah. We have a... Are you criticizing the other panelists? No, 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 no. 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 Apparently it's we, it's right. part of... Part of we, we, write, we, write report, we write reports on this. Yes. <laughs> so, so, so we have... We have so you have, a, you have an interest in making the we question very, very complex. Sorry, Isn't sorry. that true? So it's, it's more of a luxury. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we have a team in the U.S. that uh, I think is no, it's, it's, it's no secret we helped... The, uh, with the, the Obama administration, the, the restructuring of, 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 of their, their auto industry when, when Detroit was in crisis. Out of that, we did a lot of work related to how is the United States competitive? Is it getting more competitive? We ended up publishing about six reports uh, titled Made in America Again, and then the Manufacturing Renaissance, and a number of, of reports on that the United States was on the verge of, of a resurgence of manufacturing and competitiveness. So the U.S. is getting more competitive. They're now competing competitive against China in, in production. And a lot of jobs are coming back to the U.S. This is huge politically. So what we did in, <clears throat> this was the fall of last year, in BCG Nordics, we, we did some research into the Nordics. So how is, is the Nordic region doing? Is the same thing happening here? Are we also getting more competitive? Uh, and we looked at Denmark as well. And, and I'm, I'm sad to say, or sorry to say, uh, that our outlook is quite pessimistic. Uh, we, we have lost, uh, you know, an incredible number of jobs uh, in, in the manufacturing sector, from, I think, from, from half a million people working in manufacturing in the, in the 1990s to 345,000 today. Uh, and we expect to lose an, an additional 64,000 uh, by 2020. So, so we're bleeding jobs. Uh, that is partly because of the competitiveness, uh, you know, uh, it is a very competitive world. Uh, and then, to me, that, you know, there are a few questions to Denmark, you know, that that raises. One, sure, what are we going to do instead, right? So, great, we'll just do research. We'll do, you know, Viden, Viden Great. I, but one of, the, one of the funny things is once you move a production job, usually R&D moves later. So, so I think there is still need to be competitive, right, and in, in, in production. Uh, the reasons are many, and I think, you know, the costs are rooted in, in we're too expensive, we lack uh, productivity, we haven't kept, particularly in the, in, in, the, in the services and public sector, our productivity is not as high. Um, I think when you look at uh, also some of the education, the PISA results, uh, this, is a, this is a macro level, right? So I think there are a number of high-level challenges for Denmark. What do we want to do? Mm. What, what do we... You know, what do we want to live of in, in, the, in the future, right? Uh, I was talking to one of my colleagues, you know, the, in, in Arla. Yeah. The, the, uh, you know, in, in, it, it, it's great. I mean, we have a, a, a number of food companies in, in Jutland, right? Uh, a, a food cluster. It's, it's, it's fantastic. What, we've, what we're doing in Denmark in the food cluster is, is astonishing. It's one of the, the top in the world, if, if not, uh, you know, at least very, very, very competitive. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's a privilege and it's, uh, it's great, but where is the infrastructure? How do we get, how do we attract you to go to companies like, like, like Arla, right? Uh, so there are some, I think my challenge or my question to you is, is twofold. One, uh, our politicians need to do something because there are a lot of reforms that are needed and, and uh, an action needs to be taken or, or else the future doesn't look too bright. But, but two, and also something I like, there's also a part of personal responsibility. What do you want to do, knowing the competitiveness, that it is a very competitive world, it is going to get worse, the competitions, I mean, the, the, the applicants that we have, that we, that we see, are just incredible. I mean, the, 
it just it is really a competitive world. Uh, but to you, I mean, what do you need to do to compete in this world? Uh, and uh, yeah, I guess no. I, I look forward to, to hearing the answer. But now, Martin, Martin made the point that you can tell a Dane. A Dane is someone yeah. who is rude, who doesn't take no for an answer, and so forth. Is, is that true? How do you recognize a Dane? How do we stand out in the crowd? Yeah, but I, I think that I think those are very positive qualities. Yeah. I, I, I like. I mean, I, I am Canadian. Uh, I've been educated in Canada, the UK, and the US. But my wife is Danish. My two kids are Danish, uh, and I, I love Denmark. Uh, and I think that that's right. Danes are are direct, which is a very good trait. Uh, Danes push back. Uh, you don't you you don't just order around a Dane. You need to explain things, and and I think that's good. I think, <laughs> but I think I think that's good because. <clears throat> If you talk about vision jobs and creativity, you, 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 don't, you shouldn't just be told, you know, do this. You need to question things. You don't and need to talk about your wife all the time. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> my wife, my colleagues. But it's true. And so I think, those are, I, think I, I recognize those and I think are positive. I see them positive as well. All right, Jakob. First questions first. What is the biggest challenge facing Denmark? Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, I agree with uh, Ian's analysis. Uh, that's the gloomy picture. Um, we are challenged on, on the competitiveness of Danes as a population. We're challenged on too high cost and too low productivity. Um, <clears throat> but there's some good news in that. So why don't we start there? You guys, you're off the hook on both. You know why? Well, one thing is you're productive, right? You work a lot, I assume. That's good. That's a start. Um, <clears throat> there's one, one particular function of employees where Danish costs are not too high, they're actually below average. You know what that function is? Come on, you're supposed to be smart, come on. What is it? It's what you're trained for. It's top management. Nowhere in the world is top management as cheap and still reasonably good, in all modesty, as in Denmark. So that's a good start. You want a they, career, you want to... You know. I'm sure they want to change that. <laughs> Maybe they don't start here. Maybe they don't work here. You want to take that into consideration, right? Anyways, um, back on a, on a more serious note, um, the challenge is that that we um, have we work too little. That is what it is. In the public domain, <clears throat> when there's a debate going on in in Clement Show and mm -hmm. elsewhere, it's about a trade-off whether we stay creative with a high autonomy and, and a high, large focus on the individual as well as a team. Group work, that trade work, trade off uh, be, between that and working more. And I know I sound like an old grumpy grandpa. There's no trade off. We have to keep our values. We don't want to copy other nations that just work more. We want to keep our good traits. And they are very important. I totally agree on the description of the typical obnoxious but pretty good Danish employee who doesn't take orders, who always has a second opinion and says yes when he means no and goes do something else. In the end, it's good. It is good. And you can see a difference even, even just from here to our neighbor, nearest neighboring country. That's good. Keep up the group work in the schools. We laid Anas Bondo. Those of you who are Danes, you know who he is. Let him keep the schoolwork, the, the group work, the freedom, the autonomy, but add more hours, add more hard work in the schools, and perhaps play a few, uh, a little less video games. <clears throat> That's the recipe in the school. I think it's simple, and I think it is lost in the public debate. There's one area where the public cannot spend too much. That is education, <clears throat> especially with our cost level and so forth. For a company, the, the, the similar area where, fortunately, you cannot uh, overinvest is what? Innovation. Innovation. Sure, you have projects that fail, but if you invest enough, you hire the right people, smart people, those obnoxious Danes, as well as a few others, you get innovation. And the good news is, even for Danish innovation, there are millions of customers out there. And we can probably get back to that. Why, <clears throat> Why that is, despite a crisis and so has there been, do you believe, a change of mind? Do you think that over the past five, seven years, people have understood the severity of the challenge? Or is it some people who have understood it and a lot who still haven't? 
Are you on the Danish uh, uh, workforce or are you on the global consumer? On the Danish workforce. On the Danish workforce. Well, too little. Too little. I think it's lost in, 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 in the, the skew and the stalemate of the public debate because it, it's, it's portrayed by both parties, really, as a trade-off. Mm. Right? We either stick to the cozy corner or we work more and we become like some of the Asian role models. And none of them seem perfectly appealing. And I, I don't think it's a compromise. All right, Torben, do you agree here that there is something that might be lost, that if we just changed ourselves completely and started copying everyone else, we would lose something valuable, as Ian said. Would we lose something that we would like to keep, as Jakob mentioned? Well, um, let me also just uh, take one step back and, and briefly introduce Arla to, uh, sure. to, to the ones not, uh, not familiar with uh, Arla Foods. Um, Arla Foods is, as you might know, a, a global dairy company, and uh, we are... Uh, not publicly listed. Uh, we are owned by approximately 13,000 farmers uh, across six uh, geographies. And um, for those of you who have read the, the newspapers today, we, uh, we announced today our results for 2013. And just to give you some highlights, uh, I mean, we, we are now approaching uh, 10 billion euro in turnover. That's uh, 74 billion uh, Danish. It's plus 17% in revenue growth. Uh, we reported um, record profits to 2.2 billion. Um, Denmark is actually now less than 10% of our total turnover. We have sales to plus 100 markets uh, across the globe. So basically, we've gone from, like, like Carlsberg, from, from a small Danish cooperative dairy company in Jutland to, to, to a global and, uh, and leading dairy company. What, what does that imply for, for us? Uh, it, it basically implies two things, and two of them were already mentioned. That's something about how do we ensure that we get sufficient talent, and how do we ensure that we are still cost competitive because uh, Arla Foods is producing significantly in Denmark and other Nordic countries. Um, <clears throat> but let me, let me add just a third component to that. Uh, and, and that's uh, sometimes, I, I think it sometimes gets lost so when we are here in Copenhagen. That is, that's actually a challenge that we are facing in, uh, in, in Jutland. Uh, how do we make sure, um, as you might know, Arla, Arla and uh, not only Arla, but also Danish Crown and uh, some of the other bigger food companies have headquarters in Jutland. How do we make sure that we are also com competitive and attract talent outside the Copenhagen area. And that, that, is, that is kind of one of the big challenges that, uh, that we are facing. And I think also that Denmark is, is facing. The question is basically, how, how do we make sure that we have the right bets and that the bets are not only located here in Greater Copenhagen? What is the answer to that question? <laughs> I think, uh, I think one, of, one of the answers is that, uh, that we need to, I mean, at, at least the leading companies, we need to work very closely with the, with the Danish government. That's one thing. And, uh, and uh, we need to make sure explicitly what are, because Denmark cannot compete, and I, I firmly believe that Denmark cannot compete in, in, all, in all industries. That's simply not possible. It's like, it's like us, or it's like, uh, like Carlsberg. We cannot compete in every market. Uh, there, there, is a, there is a limitation to resources. So, uh, so one way of doing it is basically make sure that both government and leading companies within an industry join forces. And I think that's, that's the key. And I think that's something we have been very good at in the, in the food industry. I mean, as uh, Ian said, we are one of the biggest clusters in the world, um, especially uh, within dairy. We have overproportional high market shares. Mm. Um, and we are, act we, are act we, are actually, we are actually establishing... Work, work, workforce in Denmark, so we're not downsizing. We're actually invest, invest, investing heavily both in production, but also in R&D. Uh, so it's a combination of white collar and blue collar that we're trying to attract. So how will you make that argument? I mean, to some of these people, if you go back to the question we asked just a couple of moments ago, they all want to go abroad, they all want to yes. work for, for Apple. Uh, and, and, and so, sure. so <laughs> they're thinking, you know, cheese and milk, who needs it? How would you put the case to them and say, well, you need to come work for us. This is exciting. This is, uh, that's actually quite simple. Uh, <laughs> because I, I actually do believe that uh, Arla is uh, one of the most attractive employers in Denmark. We are heavily growing, and the growth is outside, it's outside Denmark, and it's outside the Nordics. So, so that means we are investing heavily in Asia, heavily in Russia, heavily in Africa. Um, and our industry is, is not consolidated. It's extremely fragmented. That means there is no clear number one or number two, like in the brewing industry. It's not there. So, so, so we, we experience tremendous growth rates, and we, we experience actually a game. It's, it's basically a consolidation and a globalization game that we experience in our industry. So if you want to be part of that journey, 
I think Arla is the right place. I don't think there are many other companies in Denmark that can offer that. Actually, I don't think there are any. All right. Now, before we continue the discussion and ask you for your questions, two more questions for you. The first is this. Do you think the global financial crisis is over? Now, by this, uh, we don't mean sort of the financial crisis just in terms of, you know, Wall Street going belly up. We need sort of the crisis as we came to know it back in 2007, 8. Is the crisis over? What do you think? Yes, no, not quite, or don't know. <coughs> I've been to a lot of conferences. This is the first one I've been to where this has worked. <laughs> not quite. Don't text it. <laughs> That's true. Yes, no, not quite, don't know. Now, is, is this true? Uh, in fact, no, let's take, we'll take one more question for you before we go to, back to the panel. When would you expect a new financial crisis to break out in one to five years? This is the sort of thing that your teachers and lecturers are paid to know, right? In five or ten years? In six to ten years? There's something wrong there, isn't there? It should be in one to five years, first five years, then the next five, and so forth, right? So 1 to 5, 6 to 10, 11 to 15, 16 to 20, never, I don't know. All right. Two percent of you are saying that there will never be another <laughs> crisis. Now, there's a, there's a firm, solid belief in the supremacy of capitalism here at, at uh, CBS then. Anas, Anas has, has something changed now in terms of this outlook. Let's just go to the really principal level here. Now, uh, I, this is new, isn't it? I mean, if we talked about this five years ago or ten years ago, there would have been some confidence that we were in a great world and it was only getting better. This is new, isn't it? Is, a, is it a good <laughs> thing that people look to the future with a little trepidation? There we go. Thank you. We had the financial crisis 1,000 years ago. We had them 100 years ago. We had them five years ago. We will have them within the next 20 years. Yeah. Perhaps in another different shape or form, but they will come again. Because they are basically based on greed, OK? So greed, ambitions, and big egos, and lack of regulation. And the question being, so now we have new regulation on the banking systems, on management systems, and all different kind of, of industries. And will that prevent another financial crisis? I don't think so. So there will be another financial crisis. But every time there's been a crisis, we learn something, and we take something away. Mm. And, and I think we, we did the same this time. But uh, the answer to, to the question, will there be a new crisis? Yes. All right. And, and do you think, is it a good thing? I mean, People are a little, I mean, you all want them to be confident and believe in themselves and so forth. Is it a good thing to look to the future with a little trepidation and say, we don't quite buy it, we are a little worried, we are a little concerned, I almost no one will rule out the risk? Yeah. I think, you know, what, what we are working a lot with is, during the financial crisis, you had years where you would go into industries and you would see they were playing not to lose, okay? Uh -huh. So you're being very defensive. Now you see a lot of industries... Ala, Carlsberg, other, Saxo, Relux, that are playing to win. So mm -hmm. I think industries are gaining new momentum. Okay, so it's kind of very sociological. You can only stay in a crisis for like five, six, seven years, and momentum changes. All right, and, and, and so right now, what I think is interesting is when you look in Denmark and you look globally, and we talk a lot about crisis, what I see in a lot of industries, amongst the players that are doing very well, having to say, yeah. but also uh, next level, there is a lost to play to win. They want to change the agenda. And I think that's very important. And they need you. They need talents. They need innovation, as was being said, to drive that play to win agenda. So it's, a, it's kind of in many corporates right now, there is a, from, from management, there's a need to create this cultural change. All right, to so say a little bit more about that, what is the difference between a company that plays not to lose and one that plays to win? Okay, so you don't take any risk. So now what you need, fundamental one, but number one. If you want to drive business, you need to take risk. If nobody wants to acquire risk, there's no business. So the fundamentals of all business, all industries, 
is that you need to take risk. You need to take chances. Same as in sport. But when you do it, you need to be very well prepared. And you need to know what you're dealing with. To do that, to do the analysis, to make the good decisions, even though you carry risk, you need, you need the best talent. You mm. need the best people to be involved in that process. Through the financial crisis, you start playing not to lose, okay? So you don't take risk. You hold on what you got. You don't do any acquisitions. You don't hire new people. So you kind of lay down everything and you wait until the storm is over, okay? And I think the storm is over. Uh, it's not completely over, but we are coming to the end. All right, now, Mas, same question. Can you see the difference? Is this true? Is, is Anna's right that P companies today are playing rather than being defensive about it, they're being offensive? Is it true? Yes, yes. So, so, so some companies can look at the crisis as a bad thing. You know, some companies can also look at the crisis as actually the opportunity to do the investments. So the assets they're going to acquire would be able to be bought at a lower price. Uh -huh. So, of course, of course, it also influences your own stock price. So there's a give and take here. But, but the players who actually use a crisis to go to the next level and be prepared to the upswing afterwards are the, are the companies who will win. Martin, Martin is, is this true? Are Danish companies behaving different today? I think it's very hard to, to take every, everybody under on one uh, shield and say this is how they do. I think, it's, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities for everybody here. Um, you have an extremely growing middle class in, in many countries in China. Um, so you have a lot of consumers who used to uh, brew their own alcohol and getting blind. You had a lot of... Maybe somebody still do, and uh, I don't know. And uh, now they want to bottle, uh, bottle beer. Um, you want better milk, you don't want to... You have seen the scandals in the milk industry, and in the financial industry, and in my industry. Uh, mm. We have been hit very hard by regulation. I think it's actually... It has been a very good thing uh, in many ways that uh, it's more regulated. Now, we, we don't need to take it much further. I think we also need to have a free market. But, but actually, I see the, a lot of opportunities for a lot of Danish companies, for a lot of you guys out there. Because there's so much, so many new consumers, prosumer, whatever we call them. All right, Ian. Now, to what extent is it true? I mean, we're going to talk about the general picture for a, a couple of more minutes about sort of these general principles. We're going to see questions, and then we're going to move on to sort of the recruitment uh, uh, issues. Might one might say. To what extent is it true today, and will it always be true that you have a handful of Danish companies, the C20 companies, but a bit more than that? Uh, that are truly globally competitive. They can measure up to your standards. They can talk to McKinsey. They can be in global markets. We have some of them here. Mm -hmm. And then you have loads of other medium-sized companies, small companies that aren't competitive and they aren't going to be. And basically, you have two very different set of rules. One for the home market, where the next 10 or 20 years are going to be really tough. And then one that applies to only a very small handful of companies. Is this a realistic picture? in the future as well? Or will we see some of the smaller companies actually moving up the ladder? Well, I, I think we need to count on that, right? Because when you look at, at Denmark overall, we do have only a handful of, of large companies, right? Yeah. It, it is the, the, the smaller companies is where a lot of the, you know, a lot of the innovation and entrepreneurship needs to happen. Uh, I think also a message to you, 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 if you want to make it big, sure, a good company is a great place to learn. But, but a lot of the, the, the you know, startups and a lot of knowledge is transferred from large companies to smaller companies. And Denmark will need both the large ones and, and also smaller ones that become big. Is there any good reason? Do you have a simple explanation why small and medium-sized companies can't grow? I mean, if you look at the C20, some mm -hmm. of the top Danish companies, many of them are old. They go back a long time. They have survived, but they go back. Why is it so difficult to make a new big <coughs> company in Denmark? Is it a question of mentality as well? I, I, it, it may be, but I think you know if you look at uh, if you look at companies like Lego, they have reinvented themselves and, and very recently, right? Yeah. So so I think it, you know put it, putting it into perspective, Denmark is a country of five million people. It's yes. the size of, of Seattle, close to where I used to live. Uh, you know, it, and what Denmark has in terms of you know companies like this panel is truly impressive, right? So so maybe the next. Big comp the big name is not uh, still small today, but hopefully in, in 10 years we'll see new names, right? I think. Uh, All right, Jakob, now for some of these companies, some of the smaller companies, what is the first thing they need to learn? If they want to be global, if they want to attract the kind of people who are sat here, what do they need to do? 
they need to, to basically act like we've seen um, most of the big companies and a lot of small media science companies do in the past five years. During the, what we call the financial crisis, from eight to today, what happened to the stock market? It's at least from nine, it's, it's more than double, right? And the stock indices right now, they are, they are at record level by almost any measure. <clears throat> Not because of the crisis, but, but because most companies took advantage of the crisis to clean house, yeah. right? Clean their value chains, outsource, streamline, grow, acquire, consolidate industries, and, and, and. And that's what you need to do. And let's be specific about size. Size matters, but it's a relative thing. You can be a small, mid-sized company, but as long as you're a big player in your pond. Mm. The term, you know it, relative market share. You know it, Mr. BCG. Relative market share is what, what's important. It's not, it, 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 you're not necessarily better off just because you're a 10 billion uh, company in a 100 billion industry. Right? It's much better to be a 1 billion in a 1.5 billion yeah. industry. Anas? Thank you. Yes. I think it's very important to remember that when you look at, uh, at Ala and Carlsberg and Velux, and you look at the ownership structure, these companies once were small companies. They were startups, but they were structured in a foundation. They cannot be acquired. We have two-thirds of small and medium-sized companies in Denmark today. A lot of them are being acquired every year. Mm. Okay? So they are being acquired by foreign companies. We had a lot of acquisitions this year of small and medium-sized uh, corporates being sold with extreme talent, with extreme technology. There are niches. There are perhaps 10, 15, 20, 100 people. They are doing extremely well in the industry but they don't have an ownership structure where they cannot be sold. It's typically family-owned business. The father is on his way, or there's a young son who wants the money. There's a lot of talent in the small and medium size. This is the backbone of our industry. And the volatility, look at Saxo. They were created in 95, almost, perhaps a little bit. It's a young company. It's a great company. It's a young company. So there's a lot of potential in the small and medium-sized companies. What they basically need is talent like you. Mm. They need to accept that to develop and to grow, they need more professionalism into the company. But the reason why we don't have more Carlsberg, Arla, Velux is not because we don't have them. We do have them. But they're just sitting with foreign groups, a number of them. All right, now questions from the floor. Raise your hands if you have a question. And we will bring a microphone to you immediately. Someone up there? All right, stand up. We have had a question. And we will get the microphone to you. There we go. Yes, sir. Please stand up. And uh, can you shout? Talk to us loudly enough. All right. I will refrain from re repeating your question, <clears throat> but I think we all understood the meaning of it. I think it's back to uh, investment in education, and education means everybody. Everybody. That's the, that's the simple answer, mm. and, and it's the only chance, and also we would like to, to keep a society that is uh, uh, coherent, right, where the difference between rich and poor is there, but it doesn't have to be as big as in some other places in the world. Uh, we believe there's a, there's a force in that. And especially if you, have a, if you have that, you can have a higher share of the population that is educated. And then you have a competitive strength. So it's not just to be nice. It's also because it is competitively a smart thing to do. Now, you talked about innovation earlier. Can you teach someone to be innovative? Can you teach them to be creative? Yes. Or you can? Yes. <clears throat> I think our school system does a, does a great job with too few hours, they do a great job in, in, in that. They do a great job here. But we have more, and that's the good news. We can do more. Mm. 
May I ask, are we ever going to see self-made men? I mean, we just heard the point, uh, uh, Anna's made it, uh, the rest of you made it, that, that some of the biggest gaming companies, they were startups. Of course, they start out from one man. Are, are we going to see that? Are we still in 20, 30 years going to see the last lessons of the day that, that, that jump out of nowhere? Or will everyone have an MBA? No, hopefully, hopefully. So two things in that question. So, sure. so first of all, yes, I think we will see people who make inventions. I actually see you know, a lot of the technology being there for people to get, you know, crowdsourcing, uh, kickstarters, you know, getting, getting new ways of getting the money to get your ideas out there. I'm following many of them myself with great interest. So yes, if you have the right idea, if you have the right business plan and, and you have the guts to try, you know, it can be done. So, so I'm quite positive on that and seeing, seeing also Danish starters uh, in, in that area. Do you agree with Jarab? Can you teach people to be creative? Can you take 20 people, put them in a room, say, I'm going to make you all creative geniuses? Let, 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 let me explain how we do innovation in Carlsberg, because it's, that's, of course, a very, you know, there's a bit of heritage in that. So based on the foundation we have, as part of that, we have our innovation lab, which has been there for 100, 100 years. The old brewer actually created that because he believed in innovation. You know, he invented the, the real yeast. So, so how do you do that? Well, by incorporating in a company and actually making sure that it's, it's there, it's used, and the, the right people are given the right time to, let us say, fool around with some ideas. I think one of the issues we have right now, and, and we talked about this in the break, you know, there's a balance between, yes, I want innovation, but I want it tomorrow, mm. right? And, and that cannot be. So if you really want innovation in a, in a company, you also need to make sure you have the ability and the, uh, the timing in order to give uh, people peace and quiet to do real innovation. Torben, how do you do that? Because, I mean, you made the point earlier that, that you are so uh, small in the global market that you can't compete in every single market there is. Some of your competitors are truly huge. They are there in every national market. Uh, do you agree with, with Mass that there's a need for long-term strategy there? And how do you find the resources to say, this is an effort we're going to make? Well, I mean, uh, obviously for, for Ala, innovation is key because uh, in, in, innovation is the, the, only, the only differentiator for us, uh, not only against our competitors, but also against uh, what we call for private label, which yeah. is the, the, the retail-owned brands. And, uh, and that's something we have seen in the crisis, especially in the mature markets, that retail labels, they are gaining shares. Um, so that's a big challenge. So innovation for us is, is, is fundamentally um, the way we, uh, we, are, we are actually investing now 250 million Danish in a new innovation center in, in Denmark. So we are actually moving all innovation resources back to Denmark. They've been dispersed uh, in, in different countries. Why, why are you doing that and from where are you moving them? Uh, it's, it's basically different geographies. We had something in Denmark, we had something in Sweden, we, we had something in Germany, UK, etc. I mean, we have quite a lot of companies during the last years. We have done our biggest investments throughout the crisis, actually. And that's where we have grown. Uh, so we have taken the bets during the crisis and made a leap uh, in terms of growth. So it's from different countries. And one of the reasons why we are, why we are moving them to, back to Denmark is because we still have a lot of production in Denmark. And uh, we do believe that there is a significant uh, linkage. And I think, Ian, you mentioned that as well. There, there is a significant uh, link between production and innovation. So that means if Danish companies move production out of Denmark, innovation is the next. R&D is the next. All right. That's how it typically goes. So that implies we need to be cost effective. But Tom, I mean, we've heard yes. this argument being made yes. that you need blue collar uh, workers there, you need production manufacturing yes. in order to have innovation. We've heard the argument being made. You're saying you are now experiencing this. Yes. W what is the point? What, how does it make a difference? I mean, if I'm an engineer, if I'm a biologist, and I don't sit uh, near the assembly line, does it make a difference whether I'm in London or in Copenhagen? Yeah, I think it, it, it does make a difference, uh, certainly. I mean, f first of all, we have not only production for the Danish market, whatever we produce in Denmark is, is basically also for global markets. So yeah. When you go out and buy a Starbucks in Spain or in Greece, it's actually produced in Esbjerg in Denmark. Um, and for the innovation team, it's just critical to understand uh, what the cost implications are of their ideas. And that's something you do together with your manufacturing. It's also, it's, it's, it's also basically to see what's possible and what's not possible. What are the, the, the business case, the cost implication behind it? And that's, uh, that's one of the key. All right, let's, let's try to keep hold of this theme of manufacturing, Ian, of course, because you made the point. This has been also an issue of political contention. Some years ago, we all thought we could just, you know, 
uh, work for companies where there's just a foosball table and nothing else. Uh, and, and we realize now that apparently no manufacturing makes a, a difference, production makes a difference. You made the point yourself. Now, um, what should the politicians do? Is there a difference between imagining Denmark as a manufacturing country, competing in manufacturing, and imagining Denmark as a Lund's country that needs a little bit of manufacturing? Does it make a difference from the kind of industrial policy that you need? I, I mean, I don't think it's an, it's an either or. Uh, <clears throat> I think you can see you can see Denmark as a, we call it high-end manufacturing yeah. country, right? That, that does innovation. I, I do believe, uh, and I agree with, with, with Jakob very much, the Danish culture uh, helps, uh, you know, the, there's an innovation culture. Just this, this questioning attitude is, is uh, it, it is, and it can be a competitive advantage for, for Denmark. So you do have that in the culture. Uh, I think it is, it is a scary situation if we do lose a lot more manufacturing. Because then you, that, that link is, is important. You need, to be, you need to be close. You need to test things as they may. As they, and most importantly, once manufacturing leaves, then what prevents the company that receives the manufacturing from developing the next iteration of products? So, mm. so then that's, they also have brains. They're also creative. They're now making them. They, they understand how they work. They come up with a version two. Right? So I think keeping, keeping production close is important for those reasons. Uh, I think we could... Definitely see Denmark as a, as a country that does both. And the manufacturing that we keep here needs to be one, competitive, automated, using technology better, uh, and perhaps focusing on the products that are most new and innovative that we want to be particularly close to R&D. But I mean, Jakob, maybe this is the scary part, because I mean, Ian mentioned that when he looks at the Nordics, he will find you know, uh, statistics there that show that this is really hard, this is really difficult. As long as our costs are reasonably high, they are, they will remain so. We have a problem keeping any kind of manufacturing here. So if you sort of follow this logic through, you will say, well, the manufacturing will leave and it will take the white collar jobs with it. Is, is that the future? It's not black and white. <clears throat> for, for assembly line production, um, Especially, you can forget about keeping traditional assembly line production long term. That's my bet. That's our bet. <clears throat> um, the good thing is, I think somebody mentioned, was it you, Clement? Mature industries. If it was a good want, point, I, it was me who made I it. Once had a clever, <laughs> I once had a clever boss who said, there's no such thing as mature industries, only mature management. And that's important, because we're disrupting value chains. And what we can do here, based on creativity, know-how, is that we can orchestrate a value chain. But they, let's not kid ourselves. There are certain elements of that value chain, they will go. The textile industry in the 60s, when that left, people thought, ooh, we're going to die. We're in another wave, and it's not, it's not all pretty. It's not all easy to see where everybody's going to go. But it's back to we have to educate as many as possible to orchestrate a disruptive value chain. Then there are differences between assembly line and process industry, and we have clusters and biotech and food. and that. That's great. I'm, I'm not particularly concerned about that development other than it has to happen. But I, I have to make, be clear. When you said the traditional assembly line work, that is, that is leaving. You can't keep it here. You, so can, you can disrupt it. You can automate. You can, you can be smart. There are factories, even in, in, in the small, medium companies. We have some suppliers that, that are Danish-based. You would not believe it. You go, can, can we produce that in Denmark? And you go see their plant, and you go, yeah, you can, right? Because they've automated. They're just smarter, faster, cheaper than the other guys. And we can do that. Anders, uh, is, is, is this realistic? Because you could make the argument that this is basically just uh, the politicians comforting themselves. They have realized now, oh, we aren't smart enough to all have these really high paid white collar jobs. So now we go back to manufacturing because that's what we know how to do. You could say that it's just a question of, of comforting ourselves. And in 10 or 15 years, we will lose those jobs anyway. Yeah, I think if, if I may just go back to the sure. point of on innovation, I think <clears throat> what we are very good at in the Danish culture is cooperation. So we are very good at, at challenge ideas and cooperate. That's, I think, we all agree to. I think what, if we should ask something from the politics, we should ask for a higher degree of cooperation between universities, technical schools, and the private sector. Mm. So when Carlsberg or Arla is doing innovation, I bet they don't do it without their customers. I bet they're doing it with their customers. So they do innovation, they cooperate around innovation, they drag in their stakeholders, and they innovate together with them. Things are changing so fast. So if you move into a lab and you sit there on your own, except if you are in Lundbeck or Novo, you will lose your clients, you will lose your customers. 
So you need to cooperate when you do innovation. But what we are not doing sufficiently today, we don't have sufficient cooperation between you, between the private sector and uh, the educational institutions. And I think that's sad because there are so many talents, there are so many ideas, there are so much innovation uh, in, in the institutions that are not being utilized together with the private sector. So I think that's one place you should start. And there are countries that are extremely good at this, so it's not rocket science. All right, now let's focus then on education. Martin, what is the one thing that will surprise these people the most? I mean, there's no one here. They believe they're winners. You heard them. They believe that they have already won. There's no one here who is not thinking about a job. They're already thinking about what car to buy for the first salary uh, check uh, and, and so forth. Uh, what will surprise them the most? Once they enter reality, once they enter the labor market and get a real job, what will surprise them? I think they, they'll be surprised on how good they actually are and how useful they are. And the Why are you sucking up to them in this manner? I mean, who are... <laughs> no, I think I, I have some very good uh, examples also in this room. So, uh, no, but I think it's, uh, it's very important to, to not keep them in a box and, and, and try to uh, not expose them to, uh, to new challenges. And, uh, All right, Matt, same question. What will surprise them, if anything? Well, I agree. We are very good. But, but I think education for me is just the getting over the entrance to a company. You know, right. For me, the real education actually starts when you start to work. Yeah. So, so I think, again, I talked about modesty before. I, I talked about adaptability. I think this is really where we should focus. So we are good at something, but how do we apply it and how do we understand the business? So you are saying that there is something, it's, it's just getting, it's just getting uh, basically one's foot in the door. There you're saying something happens once you enter the company. What happens? What can, what can a company teach you? Because these people believe that they are learning to emulate what you guys do. What can't you emulate? What do you have to learn so, in the world? So talking a bit about what you said about the, the whole value chain. So for example, we are in the fast moving consumer good business. You can read about that in books. But what does it mean? You know, how does your consumer work? How does your supplier work? How does the business work? Who are your competitors? What are the main cultural differences? You know, what is the heritage of beer? These are things you cannot learn in an in institution. All right, we'll continue with the panel. I want a question from this gentleman, please. All right, excellent question. Jakob? I think most, most attempts over time, and there were, there were many attempts over the decades, to project that now in, in seven years we need more engineers and fewer doctors. There's no need for generalists. There's only need for specialization, and the more specialized you are, the better. Yeah, I think that is, uh, that's a trend, and I think it's, it is overrated. Why? Because um, whether... I think the debate is somewhat skewed here. Whether you're a large company or a small company, whether you're Denmark-based or Taiwan-based, in the end, the question up here before, will there be a new crisis, is not the right question. Mm. I'm just going to take an inroad, so bear with me. Um, because there will be a new crisis. The important question is, what will the period, the upturn that we are now entering, and we are, no doubt, what will it be like? It will be different than the last time. It won't be the, the, the bubble frenzy we saw last time. It is the end of Sam Taylor Kirchner. Forget about it. It won't come. Consumers have two important trends. We have smarter consumers, and that's your opportunity. Consumers, a couple of trends. They go for more value for money. Give me the high-quality product, low cost, no frills. That's one trend. So every company, whether, wherever you're based, you have to make sure that your mass market product is goddamn good and goddamn cheap. The other trend, and that's probably a little bit more important for us after all, is that there is no end to the demand for experience, for the story, everything that you can put in a brand. And there people want something unique, different, and that means there will be new small companies popping up. I read a statistic uh, recently that says Brazilians, you know Brazil is a growing economy, the share of young Brazilians who choose startups, entrepreneurial companies, over big companies like us is increasing a lot. And you know what? I think that's great. And it's a trend that says with disrupting value chains and technology, 
it's more open for business for anybody, even the generalists, and in some cases, even especially the generalists, who have a holistic picture of, of any business they see, and they go, hmm, I could do something. So you're saying if your education doesn't matter, then who do you hire? Why would you hire somebody over somebody else? What makes you say, this person I need, if, if their specific skills are of no interest? You know what? <clears throat> they are, when, 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 when you look at a, at, a, at a person, a candidate in an interview, there are things you can teach them, and there are things you cannot teach them. And the things you can teach them typically have to do with what kind of training you have or will give them. The things you can't change, the things you can't teach them, have to do with personality, have to do with some of that. So that's the important part. Yeah, In the end, choose the right personality, the right mind, then you can teach them the trade, because you're going to have to, as you say, um, as you're going to have to teach them the trade anyway, even if you're a consumer specialist. No, you're not. When you start in Carlsberg, you're from scratch. All right. I, yes, Ian, please. I, I, I agree. I think I, I agree. I think one of, the, one of the things that will surprise you uh, when you enter the workforce is also how, how little of what you have learned in school, you will actually use. You will have to. You will have to learn. No, no. But you, you will have to. You will have to learn again. And and the reason we hire you is because we see potential that you will learn. So what we see in you is that you have learned how to learn. And if you learn how to learn well, then we know that we can teach you something. In a short time, you will pick it up and you will be good at it, just like you were here. So that so that as well. <laughs> All right. Good, good. So, yeah, just one. I just wanted to answer that very, sure. very briefly. That, that 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 question on what should governments do or what would we do? And I would say it's it's two things. I, I don't necessarily think governments should 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 do anything in that. I think there's a responsibility to you to choose the right education that will get you a job. But there's two. There's a responsibility for us companies to be also more open-minded to who we hire. If there's one thing I've noticed in Denmark in yeah. how we recruit. Yeah. Uh, at least when in, in BCG, in, in other countries, we hire philosophers, historians, English language majors, uh, people from any background, as long as they're smart, they're good, and as you say. And in Denmark, it's ten, companies tend to hire only can Merckx and, and can this and civil engineering. It's very, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's more close-minded, and I think for us companies, I think that, that also needs to change. Is, is that changing, you think? Are we entering a labor market that would be more like the British or the American one, where you can, you know, major in classics, art history, and go on to do just anything? I, I think there's an enormous talent pool out there that we are not tapping. All right. Now, several questions here from the floor. Uh, this uh, young lady first, and then we'll continue here with this gentleman. Please, stand up. Martin, is this true? Is there a lack of hunger? Hopefully not. Uh, it's not something that I see a lot, but I think it's, uh, it, it says itself so that uh, you need hunger to, to be successful in, in all industry. It doesn't matter which education you have. So uh, I think it, it's something that politicians, you cannot blame. You can blame them for a lot of things, but you cannot blame them for young people not being hungry enough. All right. This gentleman, please, sir. Yes. Uh, you all say that you need persons with practical experience that are able to shape and form every personality as long as they're willing to work hard. Plus, we have the culture. Um, I don't know how the culture is many components and others, but we are able to form everybody with practical experience. Why do we need to do that? Why kick an issue? Why not just get a job, work your way up? courses from the uh, company and do that as you said. Why do you need that education to be able to do that? Are, are you yourself, sir, in doubt? Are you in doubt of the value of education? No. no. All right. Ian. <laughs> yeah. So I, I do think, so one, one, I do think there are some basic no, knowledge that you that you are learning. I mean, the, the, the fundamentals you need to get, and you, there are those you are learning here. Uh, I also, what, what we look at education 
is that you, you know you we want to see that sense of accomplishment that you actually started something and finished something right we also see it as a bonus if you complete marathons for example because that would that would indicate the same and if you get very high grades it means you competed against your peers and you were at the top again if you win a marathon or a gold medal that's also positive so those are the things that we see those are the things that we see as positive, right? So, so yeah, why to, take an, why to take an education? One, I know that you know how to learn, that you have learned something, and know how to, the process of learning. I know you know the basics, and I know you comp that, that it was, if it was one of the, the, the elite lines, then I know that you, you got in, that you were accepted. It was difficult to do, you competed against peers, and you ended up at the top. And that, to me, tells me a lot about how you will perform when you get into, into our company. Do you ever, ever, ever hire someone without any formal education whatsoever? Would you ever hire someone without a college degree? I think it would be, I mean, we, we would never say, we would, I would never say never, uh, but it's well, not. What would that person have? Try to paint a picture of someone where you would say, well, despite. <laughs> Yeah. You know, no education. We, I, think those, I think those traits that I mentioned. All right. uh, smart, hardworking, willing to learn. Yeah. All right, next question. There yes, people, there I have a people. question. Stand up, sir. Well, I'm a, I'm a little bit confused because uh, you are telling us that you are demanding generalists. But actually, I think the truth is that every time we have to apply for a job or an internship, you're really, like, focusing on special qualities. Um, so, I mean, what should we expect as students? Because All right. I, I, I want yes. to elaborate. Um, for example, it has been discussed whether you should take a master's degree or a bachelor degree. And it, it is evident that with, with just a bachelor, it's impossible to get a job or get started in your career. All right. Excellent question. Jakob, please. I think I need to be more precise, <clears throat> not to confuse uh, you too much. There's, there's skill and personality, right? Personality is not just who you, who you are as you're born. It's the accumulated effect of your experience and what you have done so forth. Um, that's an important trait. On your education, you're right. Let me be more precise. What you should think about, and I'm sure many of you do, is the T model. T model means you have, you have one area, at least, maybe, maybe a couple, where you know a lot of stuff. Otherwise, you haven't trained, you haven't, you haven't trained your brain. And then you have the other angle you have the ability to apply your intelligence to other areas. You're not a surgeon and a historian and a business person at the same time. That's not the point. But you're able to learn outside your, um, your vertical trait. That's how it is. So there's no way around it. I'm sorry. You have to be good at something and make sure that you, through your learning, enable yourself to, to oh, apply nice. new knowledge. Please. Yeah, just, just, to, uh, just to build on that. So... One is, be careful, Clemens. One is when you, you, when you enter the company, but, but I think also when you are in the company, what we're trying to do now is actually to exchange people across functions in the company. So it's a bit like what we're talking about here. So can you enter a finance function if you're an HR person? Yeah, perhaps you can. If you've shown the ability, the willingness, the smartness to work and understand, and then the there's really a lot of opportunity in companies when you do that because then you can start to exchange then you're not you know you don't have a copy of yourself along the along the room but you can start to discuss with others with other backgrounds with other insights all right now let's imagine that someone here is is you know hard working a good person um, keeps applying for internships doesn't get any now for whatever reason this person doesn't get any, the right internships she or he can see everyone around the person seemingly leaping ahead, and there this person is, studying and wondering, you know, um, is this too late for me? Am I somehow missing out on something I should be having? What would you do, Anas? If you fail to get the internships, if you got no on these applications, if you said, well, I'm losing out here, what should that person do? How can that... Because this is the fundament of who you want to uh, be when you move into the, uh, to the private sector, wherever you move in. You need this in your toolbox. As I rightfully was saying, we are looking at whether you actually are capable of learning and whether you are capable of using your talent. So it's extremely important that you take an education. And I don't necessarily agree that it can just be general education. I don't. I actually think that a lot of industries need deep, deep, deep uh, experts. And, and we need those. Uh, and industries need those. But 
Losers. I don't like the word losers. Okay? So one said, what do we do by losers? There are no losers. But there are many of you who perhaps didn't take the right decision. Because you, take, you took a route because your friends were taking a route. You never fully stepped up and asked yourself, is this the right direction for me? Is this is what I'm really good at and really interested in? Am I just doing this because the great looking girl, she's doing it, or my friends are doing it, or why am I doing it? So you need to, you are making some choices. And when you apply to these companies, we will see the choices you made. Were they good? So what are you doing in your spare time? What I'm looking at, Ian is looking at whether you, you did perhaps a marathon. I, I think sport is great. I look a lot on whether you have been traveling and whether you have been perhaps doing some coaching in your free time. Have you spent time coaching other people in sports? So you know, you build your talent, you build your case, you build your value proposition. At the end of the day, if what you built was not strong enough and you think you keep coming back in the line and starting all over, you really need to try harder. You perhaps need to change direction. You need to move down a little bit or perhaps try to change industry. 70% of our training is on-the-job training. That's the most efficient training. It's on-the-job training. So we will learn you uh, how, to, how to work in, in each line. So I think don't, don't give up, but please don't fool yourself. I've talked to so many youngsters that are fooling themselves. They are taking an education that is rubbish because it doesn't match their capabilities or their talent. And someone should have told them a long time ago. If not their parents, then a friend or someone else. So don't, go, spend, don't spend your time, don't waste your time on that. All right, how many of you, this is just uh, by raising your hands, how many of you have ever considered or are considering starting your own company? All right, interesting. This gentleman, please stand up, sir. Sure. <laughs> Something is changing, isn't it, when the Danes stand up and say there are no losers here, and the American then gets up to make the point. <laughs> You know what, you know what, so before I ask the panel, I'd like to ask you that question. Once you go back to the States, uh, if indeed you do, and they ask you, hey, how come anyone lives in that socialist country uh, <laughs> of, of Denmark? How come anyone remains there? Look at the, look at the weather, look at the taxes. What will you tell them? Why, why, why is anyone uh, here? Was this an invitation to anyone in the room? <laughs> no? <laughs> sure. Yeah. All right. No, I, I, th I th yeah. <laughs> All right, Jacob, then ask you, please. I think, I think your question is related to, to the one about hunger. Uh, if I translate that into sense of urgency, and if, if we elevate that a little bit, the challenge of the society lacking sense of urgency right now, and we do, um, is the same as companies who, who don't have sense of urgency. Even if you don't have the urgency, you need to create it. And as a country, 
we need to learn that we don't want to have poor people in the street to create sense of urgency. But right now, you're absolutely right. We have, as you said, too little hunger. I don't particularly like that expression, but, but we have to have the sense of urgency when we think long term that maybe our children will be all right, but our grandchildren, what the hell are they going to live on? If we take that perspective, that's important. If you take a company such as, <clears throat> as mine, we, we, we don't have real urgency. We've been profitable all the way through the crisis, but we've created a sense of urgency, at least to some degree, enough to say we want to change the company in the middle of a turmoil. So we invest more than we ever had. We change more than we ever had just to make sure that we are up there on innovation. We are down there on on costs. All right, let's, let's stay with that uh, for a moment there. I mean, let's just take, I mean, these are now successful companies in Denmark in the Danish context, but just on this point, Jakob, uh, what is the chance that Velux can stand alone, a, a company roughly the size that you have now as an actor, roughly the size as a player, roughly the size in 10 or 20 years? Will you have to gobble someone else up or be gobbled up? Neither. <clears throat> we will be here forever. <laughs> we are pretty big and we have a very high market share. And we're very keen to protect it. Now, Mas, is, is this true? I mean, do you need to grow or be eaten? Is no, that so, the choice? So, so in our business, we need to grow. All right. So, so there is only room on certain markets for certain players. And uh, that is the strategy of Carsport. And, and you, you made the point earlier in your introduction. You said, well, you've had you know, bad luck, if that's the right term, in Russia. But at the same time, I get the sense that you're saying you, you have to do this. You have to take risks. If you don't, then, then what? If Carlsberg had not changed itself 15 years ago, where would the company be today? Anywhere? Well, well let's put aside the ownership structure of Carlsberg and sure. the foundation there. If you are taking that aside, Carlsberg, in my own opinion, wouldn't have been a Danish company anymore. All right. So you would have been eaten by someone else. Yes. How, how big do you need to be? Well, right now, I, I think there are four or five players on the market in, uh, in, in the beer business. We are number four. I think perhaps there's room for, for six. But uh, if you look at market share, market by market, there's only room for one, two, or three. Is it the same for you, Tom? Uh, I completely agree. I mean, for us, it's, it's the same. We need to grow fast because our competitors are doing that as well. Um, the only difference between brewing and dairy is that the brewing is 10 years ahead, uh, which, which means that our industry is still very fragmented. We still do not see a clear number one, two, and three. Um, but we want to be one of the top three uh, globally, obviously, because otherwise Allah is not a Danish company anymore. That's, that's also my personal belief. So, Ian, what is this? I mean, if these gentlemen are, are, are right in what they're saying, basically, are we saying if we can't be in the global top ten, if you're a Danish company, you can't be in the global top ten, you might as well just wait to be bought out by someone else? <clears throat> I think Denmark and Danish companies need, need, to, need to be competitive. I think that does one thing. And, you know, related to that point, we, sure. need, we need top talent. Uh, and I think it is, it is a shame if, if the, the superstars in this room, as soon as they become successful, they leave the country, or if we can't attract superstars from outside, as, as the U.S. Uh, is successful at doing. So, so maybe I would put the question to you, what would it take for you to actually want to live here? Um, uh, maybe we don't, don't answer now, we can talk afterwards, but, but I think there, there, is need, there is need for some political change uh, to, to make it more, more attractive, uh, both for, for Danes that are successful All right. and also to attract uh, foreign, foreign people. No, it starts from, from international schools for, for kids to, to tax levels to a number, of, a number of different things. All right, now let's just take that point and keep it for the last remaining uh, uh, five minutes. We asked the question of these uh, young men and women, do they want to work abroad? Do they want to study abroad? Of course, the, the, uh, the answer was yes. Mm -hmm. What should Denmark do? What should you guys do? Forget about the, the politicians. They'll keep you waiting, I think. Uh, what can you guys do to attract these people and make sure that they apply to a Danish company rather than somewhere else? Mess, what is the brief answer? Well, creating international talent programs. That, that's what we do. So, so also just some uh, statistics right now. So we've actually created a mobility team in Carlsberg. We have a specific KPIs in many of our regions to say, so for example, our Western Europe region this year, we need to transfer 100 talents across the region. That is a KPI, we're measured on it. So that's one example. Martin, what, why would someone want to choose to work in Copenhagen rather than New York, London? I think it's very important for, for the companies in, in Denmark to be innovative. And I think, it's, I think the, the buzzword right now, and now we hear maybe Angela Merkel want to have a 
and internet only for Europe. I think protectionism, and coming back to some of the questions, protectionism in a, in a company, in a country, uh, protectionism uh, on your own values and your own ideas. I think that is actually the biggest threat uh, to us. I think we need, we need to be very open-minded, and at least for, for Saxo, partnerships is, uh, is key. We have a gazillion uh, huge FX market, and there's no, not really one, uh, one player who owns more than 2% of the market. So, so uh, you need to have partnerships to become big in this industry. Jana? I think Danish companies on the whole, even the biggest ones, offer um, relatively flat organizational structures a relatively high degree of autonomy. If you're, if you're good, if you're ambitious, and good doesn't mean you're an expert when you come in. If you want to learn, you want to work, there's, there's a shorter distance to, to the higher levels where you want to go. It's not that international uh, and, and companies from other countries cannot offer the, uh, great careers. Of course they can, but that is an, a particular edge that we have. And our companies, look around us, we are all global, we are all in top three, um, of our of our respective markets. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't be here. Tom, and then uh, Matt. Just, just let me just add an, an additional perspective to that, uh, especially for you uh, when you if, when you're in the in the face of applying for companies, and and, and that is a look look at growth, look at the growth figures. Growth growth is equal to job opportunities. Mm. So that means companies that are growing, whether they're mid-sized or big, they will create jobs. They will have opportunities in Denmark, outside of Denmark. And, uh, and I think that's also one of, obviously, our key value proposition. Now, you just made the point that you, you have to grow. How different is Arla going to be in 10 years' time, say? Are you Extremely saying that? Different. It's a different company. It will be a different company, that's for sure. Um, and, and we can already see that. That means, ba that means basically our investments will move to emerging markets. The ones, our, our acquisitions will be, for sure, outside Nordics, we've done that in the UK, where we are now clear market leader. Germany, number two, we will invest heavily in Africa, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We'll have a completely different footprint. We'll have a different culture. We'll be much more global, much more international, um, and that, that's different. That's uh, certainly different. I mean, in 2000, we were a small Danish company, so uh, we'll go fast. Anna, is this one of the new things? I mean, we have it here. Uh, Arla goes to the end of the world. It says creating growth outside Europe. Is this one of the things that the crisis has helped to change? That some of these companies aren't thinking of themselves as Danish, nor even European. They are thinking of themselves as global, as a matter of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the interesting part is also a lot of small and medium-sized companies are starting to move uh, out of Denmark and are starting to look at emerging markets, are starting to look at the neighborhood, and starting to look at, at, at other markets. So it's not only the large corporates as we, as we have here, but it's also small and, and medium-sized companies. So I think, yes, that's a, that's a trend. I think what, what, is, what I'm happy to hear is that so many of you are actually looking to go abroad. I don't think we should shut down the, uh, the borders and, and make you stay in Denmark. I think there's a huge development for you and potential for you to go out. And I think you should move out. And I think if, if you move into uh, some of these corporates here, you will definitely go out. That's what we want you to do. We don't want to keep you in Denmark. We want you to be in Denmark, but also abroad. So All right. mobility, mobility, flexibility, and the playground that we can provide is, is the key. Now, the final question of the session, Ian, for you, just a brief answer. What should these people keep in mind? What is the one thing they can't get enough of during the, the years they have to study? What should they remember to get with themselves before they enter the labor market? If you would just give them one piece of advice. I think, one, it is important that you realize what you're doing is something you, you love. You need to have passion, regardless where you end up in, and hopefully it will be one of these companies. Uh, definitely make sure that you choose something that you love doing. Uh, if you do that, you will be successful no matter what. All right. Please thank the panel. And now... And before we close down completely, I would like you to grab these and then just go through six brief evaluation questions about this session. This is CBS, so now, of course, you have to evaluate this. Afterwards, we will evaluate the evaluation. What is your line of study? I don't need to read them. You should be able to find yourself. And there will be six questions following this. We will just go briefly through.
<laughs> On which semester are you currently studying? What is your nationality? Danish, Swedish, Norwegian, and other? If you are Swedish, you have to put Swedish. You can't just say other. <laughs> All right, where did you hear about this event? Facebook, case competition, com, a friend, poster, promotion, CBS, mailer, other? What made you attend this event? <laughs> All right, and what is your overall evaluation? Now, ladies and gentlemen, before you get up to leave, I would just like to say, uh, on behalf of the people who arrange this, and they do a tremendous job, I think we can all vouch for that. Every year, when you come here, some of these guys, they go to the most important conferences, they make million uh, dollar deals, dollar deals, corner deals, uh, in their daily jobs. And I am certainly, and I know these guys are as well, always impressed by the level of professionalism uh, with which uh, these events are held. So thank you for that. Thank you for the invitation. I think I can safely say that on behalf of the entire panel. If you want to grab hold of some of these people, do it quickly. Know what you want to ask them because they have uh, uh, to leave in a very short time as well. And then, thank you for all your questions. And I think whenever we open up the floor the way we did today and we hear your questions and we hear your thoughts, we can trust safely also in the future of Denmark. So thank you. Thank you.